This episode of Living the Front Seat Life podcast is sponsored by BIPOC Peak, breaking the stigma and silence and prioritizing needs in Rochester, Buffalo, and Syracuse, New York at BIPOCParentVoice.org. Jazzcast Pros. Welcome to Living the Front Seat Life Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Kelly Marie. Now, this week we are continuing our conversation with Dr. Willard Ashley. We are going to dive a little into talking to family about mental health and what kind of questions to ask your therapist when you are looking for someone to sit down with. Also, we begin to talk about whiteness and um, being Black and the, the mental health effects of being Black in America. So I encourage you to just take a few moments and spend it with us here on Living the Front Seat Life podcast. Welcome back, Dr. Ashley. Well, thank you. Thank you again for your kind invitation. You are simply incredible. And I thank you for spending this time with me. I thank you for the work that you do. And I thank you for continuing to um, be honest and have real conversations with people around mental health, around trauma, around race, why it's important to talk about whiteness, why it's important to talk about the history of uh, our, our beginnings here in America and its impact on everything that we are going through today. Everyone would not come to my church because I own, I own I'm crazy. It may not, may, not, may not be the political word terminology, but I, it's what I learned if I grew up with. So I know I'm crazy. I know I'm certifiable, but I, I want to get help. <laughs> yes, yes. And if for no other reason, if for no other reason, DMX got it right. Y'all gonna make me lose my mind up in here. Up in here, yeah. up in here. <laughs> <laughs> so I need some help. I was trying to convince my son at one point to go to therapy. He says, well, you know, I see, he says, why do I need therapy? I said, because I'm your dad. He goes, yeah, you're right. I got a lot to talk about. <laughs> And those honest conversations around parenting, my friends all know, I tell them, listen, no matter how good of a job you are doing or think you're doing, your children are going to be messed up, period. Mm -hmm. You're messed up. It is impossible then to, they may be well adjusted, mm -hmm. right? They may have some tools in the toolbox, but they still going to be messed up. You're not in their personal relationships. You're not in their friendships. You're not in that bedroom. You are not with your child 24 hours a day. Right. They messed up. And that's okay because there are professionals that can help them figure out their issues. It's not for you to solve. It's for them to figure out how to work their way through. And to that end, my son is an adult. And I know I'm doing far more parenting now than I did when he was growing up because he's saying, Hey dad, I did what you taught me. I jumped through the hoops. I did all those things and help me understand racism at this level. That's and, and so what I had not, we hadn't had talked about bef before is helping our children, helping each other to understand how these systems that on paper are designed to help us, but in reality become feet of oppression. Yeah. And so that's when we talk about disparities. And that's when we talk, talk about not receiving the gold standard of care that others receive that may look different than us. And so how do, how do we look at health as a foot of oppression? What are the ways in which the education becomes a foot of oppression? What are the mm -hmm. ways that religion becomes a foot of oppression? Because for a lot yes. of people, you know, religion is oppressive. Yes. And I get, I get a, Fair number of people coming into coming into my private practice saying, I picked you up because I know you're an ordained minister. And I also know that that you understand what it's like when you've been harmed by religion. And I want to talk about it with somebody that, that gets it and understands and can appreciate it. So I mean, yes, there are things that individuals go through that they sit lay on the couch and talk about it, but it also help them to understand the ways in which systems have impacted their life. And what are the ways in which those things that you would think are designed to be helpful, they were not thinking about you, person of color. 
descendant of the African diaspora. And I, and I have some hard conversations. I know that some of my white colleagues get angry with me and it's like, okay, but I know I'm telling the truth. And they say, rah, 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 you know, we're pro-diversity. And I look at them like, well, I know you are, but you left out equity and inclusion. <laughs> so I'm not impressed. We had diversity during slavery. <laughs> Amen. It's having these conversations over and over and over again. And you see it, and I try not to get angry, but I do. I, I get angry, Dr. Ashley. I just, it's Absolutely. so frustrating and infuriating. This stuff will wear you out. Our anger always, or most of the time, ends up getting turned inward. If we express our anger with an angry Black woman, either an angry, angry Black guy, and Dr. Kenneth Hardy, who at one point was a full professor at Syracuse, would talk, talk about how we spend our whole lifetime, A, worrying about what, what white people think about us, but secondarily, our life depends on communicating to white people what we're not. Yes. I'm six foot two, 200 something pounds, that I am not dangerous, I'm not angry, I don't want your body, I don't want your money. Right, right. <laughs> And if I don't communicate that properly, then the, the phone call gets made or the police show up and, you know, I got to just, you know, communicate that I don't have a gun in my, in my glove compartment and I got my hands on it. And so we spend, and that stuff just wears you out. That's what I'm getting at. It just wears you out. Having to always display what you're not. I, ha I have a wonderful office in a really nice neighborhood on the other side of the railroad tracks. So I'm probably one of the few that has this office space in this location. I'm always having to make my six foot two frame look as though I'm harmless. Right. Now my boys are six two and six four. Mm -hmm. The six four son is 24 and in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And I felt safer with him in the Navy than on the streets of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Makes no sense. Right. My six foot two kid is 21 and again, looks are what they are. Mm -hmm. I had to teach them. You come home. I don't care what you have to say. You shuck and jive. You shuffle your feet. You yes, sir, massa, sir. I don't mm -hmm. care what you have to say you to get home. home. We will handle the situation later. And I hate that you can't be the tall, strong, proud black mm -hmm. man that you are in mm -hmm. all situations and at all times. Just know who you are and know that you are playing a part so that you make it home. Because your white friends don't have to deal with the same things that you have to deal with. I'm glad you have them as your friend. I'm glad that they will stand up for you when need be. But I need you to come home. And it breaks my heart that we still have to have these conversations. But we see it in the news every day. Uh, yes, I'm speechless, but I'm not speechless. I've been saying this since the pandemic, probably since 2016. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> that I've always been grateful to wake up in the morning. But these last five, six years, I've been extremely grateful when I can leave my home and come back in one piece. And I thought that was the only one that was feeling like that. And I was at a conference and I was one of the keynote speakers. And as the person was introducing me, strong black guy, muscles on top of muscles, he said, you know what, I'm afraid. And my head popped up like, where's he going with this? And he says, I, I, I do martial arts. I, you know, I have all these ways to protect myself. He said, but some folks, you know, are crazy. They may shoot you from a distance, sharpshooter. You may be in a mall or what happened at the grocery store. When I leave my house and I come back at home, it's thank you, Jesus, because some crazy person didn't take me out that I didn't even know was was in my presence. I know I am much more hyper vigilant than I've ever been in my life. I drive up and down the highway. I before I go into rest stop, I do it like scan, like who's in there. In the old days, I was like, yeah, hey, whatever. No, I don't. I scan. I don't like what I see in the restroom. I I wait. I will hold it. <laughs> I can wait. I wait till you come out or whatever. Again, walking the streets like you're saying, I don't feel as safe as I used to feel, I, or I should definitely, I feel safer walking through, in my geography, Bed-Stuy and, and Harlem than I do the other side of the railroad tracks, because where it is, and I, and I know for many of us it's anecdotal, but 
clearly is you can't deny that the aggression has gone up a notch or two or three. And it hasn't been a a clearly defined person. You know, except you're just right. black. Yeah. Yeah. Right? right. It's it's not, you know, black and and anything. Right. It's just being black. So there's right. no way that you can modify your personhood to feel safer. And after the um, the massacre, I have been evaluating my blackness in a different way. Just the reoccurring, you know, I thought I was doing an excellent job at being black in America, but knowing that we cannot even be safe in the grocery store just totally did something to me. It wasn't the same with the churches because I think maybe, you know, the history of racism in America and churches and black churches, I know that that's not always, unfortunately, a safe place for us. They know that that's where they can find us Mm -hmm. on Sunday in a church. But a grocery store, that just, you know, there is no place literally that you can safely be black. And that is a weight that I don't know. I'm dealing with it. And, and it's a loss that not enough of us fully appreciate. Yeah. And, even, and even among my black colleagues who I hold in high esteem, I keep saying, do you understand the sense of loss that was taken? You talk about the loss of innocence. We lost mm-hmm. our safety. And you're right. We, we know that Dr. King's mother was killed at the piano in church. We, we got that. We know that four, four little girls were, were killed in a bomb trying to go to Sunday school. We know the history of not feeling safe in church, but you're right. There are other places in the community. We are communal people to begin with. So let's just put that out there. Black folks tend to be communal to begin with. And so, yes, the church, it gives us sustenance. It gives us life, but so does going to the grocery store. We, we see our friends and our neighbors and our colleagues and we, we do more than just it's more than just buy food. We talk to each other. We say, hey, how's it going? We learn about who, who's in the hospital and who, who, who got out the hospital and who got a new job and all those kind of things. So it's not only a place to purchase food. It's almost like a better terminology, a community center. Mm hmm. Because we know if I go if I do, if I go first thing in the morning I'll see this person. If I go, go shopping around this time, so and so shows up, and yeah, we we know the cashiers, we know the stock people, and we know to ask for wait, you know, go on this day, and the new food comes out, and the, you know this comes out on that day, and all that. Yeah, I think so so it's more than just a place where you do a transaction. It it, it is a community meeting spot for us, and that was taken away, and it wasn't. And this this is the part that I have had the hardest time getting people to understand it wasn't only buffalo that got taken away because we think like a collective if yes it in buffalo it can happen in san antonio it can yes. happen in seattle it can happen in richmond it can happen in bed yes. and in south bronx and jamaica at plains etc so yes the horror the gun was shot there but we felt it also and I've had, and I, I do support groups literally around the country. And I've had people of diff, different positions in life saying the same thing. We felt the loss, not, not the same way that our brothers and sisters did in Buffalo, but vicariously, we felt their pain and their pain impacted us. Why? Because we could be next. Yes. And how do we begin to heal? How do we, my my answer to that question when white folks ask the question is we, we have to go back to our racist beginnings. And until we can acknowledge that the folks raped and stole and killed for this land, these things will continue to happen. Anything else is gonna be a Band-Aid. That has been my response. You're on target. I just had this conversation with one of, one, of, one of my colleagues, and she's white, Jewish, well, was one of my supervisors in another, another life, so to speak, and we were talking about, and she was saying that she was in, in a um, meeting. They want to talk about racism. Let's talk about racism. She said, well, how about talking about whiteness? Mm-hmm. Without whiteness, we wouldn't have racism. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's talk about how we 
like you said, raped and killed and stole legacies and how we we act privileged even when even when we don't, we don't deserve it and how because of how we behave how that has impacted history in a group of people and she said they didn't want to talk about that they want to talk about yeah yeah well then and if we're not going to talk about looking to me talking about our behavior and our legacy of violence our legacy of stealing then why are we having this conversation? Because otherwise, you're trying to put it all on black folks. They have they have to fix it, like as though they made the problem. They didn't. We did. Right, and that seems to be the general reaction when it, it comes to conversations like these. You know, not to get off topic, but I remember having a similar conversation around um, consent and rape and sexual assault. Mm-hmm. And you know, it, the the conversation was we need to well, let's teach women how to express consent. And I'm like, well, men are doing the raping. So why not talk to men about their actions? This is not happening by, you know, some phantoms that just are apparitions and appear. These are human beings that are male that are perpetrating these acts. That's where the conversation needs to lie. Mm -hmm. I should be able to walk down the street and mind my own business and not have that concern as a woman. Will I get home safely? Right. We have to have the proper conversations in their right place by the by the right folks. So I just wanted to put that out there. The late Dr. Carl Bell, who who was a black psychiatrist, practiced primarily in the Chicago area, said it this way. You spend time learning how to treat rat bites. How about we just kill the rats? (laughs) That makes sense. Right. Kill the rats. We don't have to worry about treating rat bites because they don't exist to bite. Right. <laughs> let's let's take this upstream. How yeah. about we just eliminate the issue mm-hmm. so that there is no problem down the line? Yeah. Yes. And that's the work. That is the education. That's the dismantling of the systems. That's, you know, addressing whiteness, addressing blackness, addressing, you know, we just can't say whiteness and blackness. You know, our indigenous brothers and sisters have had their land taken from them and mm-hmm. will never get it back. Mm-hmm. So we can't just stop at slavery. We have to have that whole conversation. And all of this plays into mental health. I appreciate you taking the time. I know that you're flying out to Lyon, France to, to lead conversations there next week. And mm-hmm. after that, you'll be back here. You'll be presenting in both Rochester, Buffalo and Syracuse. So no matter which one you go to, you will be able to hear from Dr. Ashley thank you. Do you have any closing words? I thank you for the opportunity to share with each other. And I just want to say to those that are listening, you are not alone. It is a we, and we are in this together. There are other places that have experienced what you've, pl- what you've experienced, and they, w- they want to be helpful. We're going to make those connections. We're going to have people to walk alongside of us. Because We didn't experience it firsthand, but through your pain, we felt pain. Thank you, sir. I cannot wait to greet you face to face. You have helped me process life a little bit more. And and I appreciate that. I I truly do. That wasn't the intent. You know, it was only supposed to be a 15-minute quick conversation, but... I truly, truly thank you for taking the time out and just being yourself and your journey. And to you, thank you for listening. Please like, subscribe, share this podcast with someone else. I think there's great information here. You know, we're living the front seat life and what a great way to help others do the same by sharing the podcast. So until the next time, be the light.